What if I told you that if I had this string and you had this string, we could verify if our strings are the same just by me sending you the following two values? If this is possible, this would certainly be magic because of how little information I am sending you. In this video, we will explore whether this is feasible, and if so, how to do it. But first, let's formalize the problem. Suppose we have two friends, Alice and Bob. Alice lives in Chicago, Illinois, and Bob lives in Guangzhou, China. Alice and Bob share a Netflix account. Both of them have what they think is the password to the Netflix account on a sheet of paper. They are both acutely aware that the password is n characters long, and every character is either a 0 or a 1. However, they are unsure if they indeed have the same password. Alice and Bob communicate by text. Each text message they send must be written in binary, and they are charged $1 for each bit communicated. How can Alice communicate to Bob in such a way that Bob is able to determine if their passwords are the same, all while ensuring a low enough charge? One simple solution is as follows. Alice will send the first bit of her password to Bob. Bob will check that bit against the first bit of his password. If they do not match, he will conclude that the passwords are different. Otherwise, he will continue receiving messages from Alice. Alice also sends the second bit of her password to Bob. Bob verifies it against the second bit of his password. If they do not match, he will conclude that the passwords are not the same. Alice continues to send her password bit by bit until she sends the last bit, which Bob compares with his last bit. If there exists a bit position where the passwords are mismatched, Bob would conclude that the passwords are not the same. Otherwise, if Bob found that all bits matched, he would say the passwords are the same. We'll quickly note that in this protocol, Alice will always send all n characters of her password to Bob, and only Bob will know whether or not the passwords match. If we want Alice to know as well, Bob can send her a single bit message after she sends all n characters of her password. Bob's message will be a 1 if he concluded that the passwords matched, and will be a 0 otherwise. This detail, however, is not important to the problem at hand. With this procedure, Alice always sends Bob exactly n characters, and this procedure is deterministic, as Bob is always able to correctly conclude if his password and Alice's password are the same or different. This is great, but with very large values of n, this procedure could be very expensive for Alice and Bob. For example, for a password that has n equals 100 characters, Alice and Bob would be charged $100. We say that this procedure has linear communication complexity O of n. Naturally, we may question, does there exist a deterministic procedure in which Alice sends less than n characters to Bob? The answer turns out to be no. A simple, non-rigorous explanation is to assume Alice sent Bob less than or equal to n-1 characters worth of information. Suppose that Alice only sends n-1 characters. Then we would naively say that Bob only knows n-1 characters worth of information about Alice's password, but cannot tell what the last character is. And with this ambiguity, they would not be able to deterministically conclude that their passwords match or mismatch. A more rigorous argument can and should be made, but we will exclude that for now. So it seems like Alice and Bob cannot escape this problem without spending n dollars. However, we may choose to ask ourselves, can we find a procedure that is not deterministic, uses less than n characters in its communication, but ensures a very high probability of detecting equality? With this question, we are sacrificing accuracy for cost. However, if the accuracy is still high, say 99.99%, we may be okay with this if the cost drops drastically. It turns out that the answer to this question is yes. We will use a technique called fingerprinting. To explain it, consider this example. Suppose you are in a room with 25 people, 
and you are provided with knowledge that exactly one of these people is a criminal, and your job is to catch them. The police have provided you with an exact picture of what this criminal looks like, their exact height, and their exact weight. With this full information, you will be able to catch the criminal every single time. However, suppose the volume of information provided to you was smaller. That is, instead of being provided with a ton of data such as the picture, height, and weight, you were provided with much less data, say, an image of this person's fingerprint. Since fingerprints are essentially unique, you would still be able to catch the criminal more often than not, but you would perhaps make an error every once in a while. The idea here is the same. We will transform the identity of an object, in this case the password, into a small piece of data called a fingerprint. And using that fingerprint, we will have Bob determine an identity with very high probability. Here is the procedure written out. Alice has her password A. She then develops a fingerprinting algorithm called H. Alice then computes H of A. Alice then sends her fingerprinting algorithm H and the actual fingerprint of her password H of A to Bob. Bob computes H of B using the H that he obtained from Alice. If Bob finds that H of A equals H of B, then he will conclude that A and B match. If H of A does not equal H of B, then Bob will conclude that A and B are different and will be correct with very high probability. How high is this probability? We can ensure greater than 99.99% probability while still ensuring very small communication. We can approach 100%, but this will increase the cost. Remember that Alice and Bob's passwords are both n-bit strings of zeros and ones, which means if we view them as base 10 numbers instead, both numbers will be less than 2 to the n. Thus, to ensure that there are less than n bits of communication, Alice must send a number or a couple of numbers that are less than 2 to the n. Moreover, if Alice sends a number or numbers that are less than a, this will also suffice as a is less than 2 to the n. Here is the solution. Alice will choose a prime number found in the integer interval 2 to n cubed called p. Using p, Alice will compute a mod p. She will then send a mod p and p to Bob. Bob will then compute b mod p. If a mod p equals b mod p, then Bob will conclude that a equals b. If he sees that a mod p and b mod b are different, then he will conclude that a and b are different. There are two things we need to do to analyze if this procedure is worthwhile. First, we need to consider the probability of success. That is, we need to see if Bob makes the correct conclusion at a very high rate. Then, we must consider the communication complexity. That is, we must consider the size of information Alice communicates to Bob, and ideally this will be significantly less than the factor of n from before with our deterministic approach. We'll begin by analyzing the success probability, which requires considering two scenarios. One case is in which Alice and Bob have the same password, and the other is when they have different passwords. When Alice and Bob have the same password, we say that A equals B, but we acknowledge that Alice and Bob are unaware of this fact. Alice goes about choosing a prime P and computing A mod P. Then, by our procedure, Alice sends this information to Bob. When Bob computes B mod P, he will see that it matches A mod P. They match because an identical operation is being applied on identical values. In this case, where Alice and Bob have the same password, since A mod P always matches B mod P, Bob will always conclude that their passwords indeed match and will always be correct. When Alice and Bob have different passwords, Alice will again choose a prime P, compute A mod P, send it to Bob, who will compute B mod P, and compare it to A mod P. 
In the prior case, we utilize the fact that a equals b implies that a mod p equals b mod p. However, it is not true that a not equal to b implies that a mod p does not equal b mod p. For example, take a equals 17, b equals 19, and p equals 2. We have that a does not equal b, but a mod p is 17 mod 2, which is 1, which is equal to 19 mod 2, which is b mod p. Thus, in this case, it is not guaranteed that Bob will conclude that the passwords differ because he may see that A mod P and B mod P are the same. But now we ask ourselves, what is the probability of Bob making an error? What is the probability that Bob makes an incorrect conclusion given that the passwords are different? To answer this, we must compute the probability that A mod P equals B mod P given that a does not equal b. Mathematically, let c equal the absolute value of a minus b. We can rewrite our intended probability in terms of c. We have a not equal to b as our given, and this is equivalent to c not equal 0. Additionally, we have that if a mod p equals b mod p, then c mod p equals 0. If that last substitution is unclear, here's a more formal proof. So how exactly are we going to solve this probability? Let's take a look at the first part. Well, if c mod p equals 0, then we know that p must be a divisor of c. Also, the given of c not equal 0 just tells us that c is a positive integer. So we can compute this probability by finding the number of prime divisors of c divided by the number of choices of p. To approach the numerator, we ask how many prime divisors does c have? It turns out that c has less than or equal to log base 2 of c prime divisors. This fact follows from the result of Guy Robin, who in 1983 showed that the number of prime divisors of a number n is O of log n divided by log log n. Note, since a and b are both less than 2 to the n, then c is also less than 2 to the n. So C has less than or equal to n prime divisors. Returning to our fraction, we have found a bound for the numerator, so we should now approach the denominator. Recall that the value p is chosen from the integer interval 2 to n cubed. How many prime numbers are there to choose from this interval? By the prime number theorem proved by Jacques Adamar and Charles-Jean de la Vallée-Pousson in 1896, who used ideas by Bernhard Riemann, the number of primes less than or equal to n for some integer n is roughly n over log n. So the number of primes in 2 to n cubed is roughly n cubed over 3 log n. Combining the results we just obtained, we can simplify our probability and upper bound it at 1 over n. Thus, in this case, Bob only makes an incorrect conclusion with probability less than or equal to 1 over n, or equivalently, he concludes correctly with probability greater than or equal to 1 minus 1 over n. For large values of n, say n greater than 10,000, Bob's success rate is greater than 99.99%. So we've sacrificed a tiny bit of accuracy. For what? ideally for a reduced amount of communication. Let's now see how many bits Alice sends to Bob. Recall that the only quantities communicated are p and a mod p. Since p came from the interval 2 to n cubed, we know that p is less than or equal to n cubed. And since n cubed has 3 log n bits in its binary representation, we conclude that p is at most 3 log n bits long. Similarly, since a mod p is less than p, a mod p has at most 3 log n bits. So in total, Alice sends Bob 6 log n bits. This is a drastic improvement over the n bits from before. For a comparison, when n equals 10 to the power of 10, we have 6 log n as approximately 198. 
Alice and Bob are saving tremendous amounts of money with the solution, all while sacrificing just a tiny bit of accuracy. To recap, Alice and Bob cannot avoid spending n dollars when it comes to a deterministic solution, so the next best thing is to come as close as possible to deterministic, and this is done by using fingerprinting. Fingerprinting can be used for many more verification problems beyond equality, such as verifying graph isomorphisms, but perhaps we'll save that for a later video. I hope this prelude into the world of sublinear communication has allowed you to see its power and its beauty. Thank you.